A look at the legendary career of Sonny Fox, up next on Carpe Diem. Hello and welcome to Carpe Diem, I'm Charlie Sanders. If you were a kid growing up in the 1960s in the New York Tri-State area, the name Sonny Fox holds a special place in your heart. For an entire decade, Sonny served as a unique and beloved father figure to millions of local children through the wit, wisdom and fun he dispensed as host of the hit show Wonderama. Sonny Fox's amazing life story, however, doesn't start or end with that landmark television program. It includes harrowing wartime experiences, pioneering contributions to the development of children's television, superlative work as an historical interviewer and journalist, and now great success as an author with the recent publication of a new book, But You Made the Front Page, Wonderama, Wars, and A Whole Bunch of Life. Still active in the television industry today and still charming audiences with his stories and reminiscences, I'm so pleased to welcome a local boy from Brooklyn who truly made good, Mr. Sonny Fox. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Nice to be described in those terms, especially the boy from Brooklyn. Well, tell us about what it's like to, to be back home and, and dealing with legions of baby boomers yeah, who remember well, the you. The remarkable thing, Charles, is that when we were doing the show in the years of doing this four-hour Sunday show, Wonderama, we knew we were popular. We had the ratings to show that. And that uh, we had uh, a certain hold on our, on our audience. I, I was convinced that I had their loyalty to the extent that I could take them almost anywhere and they wouldn't abandon me. So I could try wonderfully interesting things like the insanity of ones. I decided I was going to teach them elements of the theory of relativity. I thought, well, you know, maybe I can get the theory of absolute rest and then the heart is a clock instead of a muscle. And, and things pre, like... Pre-string theory. Yeah, no, well, well not pre-string, that's uh, right. <laughs> and, and, and I actually did it one Sunday. It was a disaster. I looked at my cameraman, they were, jaws were hung slack and the dribble was coming out of the sides <laughs> of the mouth and I could hear kids all over New York saying, what's he talking about mm -hmm. to their older brothers? And don't worry, Bugs Bunny's coming on, it's gonna be all right. And I checked the ratings the next day and, and we hadn't lost any of the audience, which was really quite remarkable. So having that, we knew that. What I didn't know, until decades later when email started showing up, is the hold that that show still has on my audience that I can meet very distinguished people, successful people in the age bracket now which is between 55 and 65. And the minute they recognize me, they regress to 10 years old like that. I was on your show and I did a joke and, and I won a prize and what was the joke? They'll tell me the joke. And if they miss the word in the spelling bee, they'll tell me what the spelling bee. Vivid, the vividness, being recognized as flattering, but the vividness of the memories is remarkable. I think, you know, for those in, in our audience who did not have the opportunity to watch Wonderama, I think we have some, uh, some clips. Uh, do, do you have the one with the little girl? We, we do. That, that's, of course, that to me. See, here's, here's what I have to, before you show that, I have to really go, go a little um, explanation. When I was given the show, when I was hired to do the show in 1959, it had already existed for years in one form or another. It was nine hours, six hours, down to four hours. And they called me and they said, we want you to class the show up a little. You know, we're not happy with what we have. So here I was with a studio, four hours to fill, the three cameras, and no talent. I have no talent. I mean, no performing talent. I don't do puppets. I don't sing, at least not the way you'd want me to do it. I, I, I don't do all those things that Chuck McCann and Soupy Sales and Sandy Becker did so brilliantly during the week. Absolutely. And they are too, their audiences love them. What was my only resource was I had a young audience in the studio every week. And I ultimately, I think it took me about six months to work this out, but I ultimately realized that was the show. So in, in Wonderama, the kids were the show. 
And the relationship we were able to build up between us, the kids and myself, based upon the fact that I didn't condescend to them and that they, they knew I wouldn't, you know, I, I, that I respected them. Well, let's take a clip of the interaction be between you and, and So that's and, what I wanted to do. Do you have the little brown eyes? We, we do. Why don't we go to that now? Because this one, to me, is the quintessential. But now, wait a minute. Just before you show it. No, go ahead. Now, we'll talk about it afterwards. So let's go to the clip. I don't want, I don't want word to get around here. So who are you going to marry? My friend. He's in my class. He, he used to be in my class. His name is Eric Webb. Eric Webb? How old is Eric? He, he's, um, I think he's seven and three quarters. Well, he's older than you. Yes. Oh, it's always nice to know an older man. Uh, why do you like him? I don't know. Well, what is there about him that makes him special? Well, he's strong. And, um... Is he polite? Oh, he's not polite, but he's, but he's strong, yes. But when, when I'm in school with him, I go up to his uh, lunch table and I sit with him and he's always playing with his friends and, and, they're all, and he's always uh, uh, talking about fresh things and um, he's always like, uh, if he had some bread, he'd stick his finger through it. Oh, he, he sounds like a delightful person. Well, uh, Eric, is that his name? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I hope you and Eric are, are remain good friends for a long time. Is he still in your class? No. Do you see him at all? Sometimes at lunch. At lunch. You look forward to lunch, huh? To being mm -hmm. able to see him. Well, I think Eric is very lucky to have a friend like you. And I, 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 uh, I, I you know, I hope you remain good friends, okay? Mm -hmm. And he's very small, but he's very cute. <laughs> okay. I think I like Eric, and I've never even met him. You're small, but you're cute, too. I was going to bring him over, but my sister, she was so <laughs> nutty, she lost two tickets, and I had to uh, let her borrow one of mine, so I couldn't invite him. Oh, that's dreadful. I would have enjoyed meeting Eric. Would you come back someday and bring Eric with you? Yeah. I hope so. We'll make arrangements for that, okay? I certainly would like to meet Eric. Matter of fact, would you like to take a present home to him? Do you think he'd like a, a um, Hebrew National snack pack? He's not Hebrew. <laughs> it's always good to have an exit line like that. Yeah, when you show it to a large crowd, they laugh at just Hebrew National Delicatessen. and they always go past the end line, he's not Hebrew, you know. But that relationship, that that one-on-one, -on -one, think of it. Everything else in the studio had melted away. The lights were gone, the cameras were gone, the cameramen were gone, the other kids were gone. It was just me and little brown eyes. And to me, that's the essence of what we were able to do on that show that made it unique. Did you uh, consciously, because there's an edginess to, uh, to Wonderama as well, were you playing to adults and parents uh, at the same time? No, I think in my, in my mind, I was playing to nine to 12 year olds. No, no, you know, they were in the bell curve, they would probably be the mass, but they started young and went a lot older. But we always had about a 30% adult audience. Now, either they, they, because they enjoyed watching the kids, as we did it on the show, or they loved Bugs Bunny. I can't tell you which, which was which. But we always had a pretty, pretty good-sized adult audience uh, that, that watched. Yeah, it's, it's amazing because it, it feels like you're walking the line there between not the way Linkletter uh, did it before, at the same time and after, but you're uh, not condescending at all, you're having the conversation, but there's an awareness that there's uh, a, a, an adult or, or an older child oh, yeah. audience. Oh yeah, there, well, but there was also an, an awareness that I was an adult and they were a child. That, now we never crossed that line, I never pretended to be a child. But what I had was an insatiable curiosity about the inner life that goes on in children. They have an inner reality that just is astonishing. And we forget, a lot of parents and, uh, and forget to sit down sometimes and just listen and po find out what's going on in that head because they have extraordinary inner lives. That, and so that curiosity of poking around in their brains was one of the things that animated me through all those years. Now, you, you say that you did not have the, uh, the kind of physical uh, talent, performing talent. But performing talent, but, but physical comedy talent of a Chuck McCann or a, a Paul Winchell, et cetera. And yet the, there were times on Wonderama where you, where you did uh, engage in, in 
stuff that really today uh, stands up. I think we, we have a clip where you had a serious uh, musician or composer on who had invented instruments. Are you going to play that? I, I, I think that okay, it's... Uh, I, I, let's take a look at that clip. Now, we are going to play a new concerto that we have commissioned for the occasion here. Mr. Bachet and I will play these um, five instruments with four hands and whatever else we can find to strike and blow. All right, sir, will you take the crystal and... Um, that yeah, one, trombone, yeah. and I'll handle percussion, okay? Et tu prêt? Yes, you prêt. Oui. Okay, here we go. I think that's right. How about a hand there, gang? What do you say? Shall we? Yeah, thank you very, very much. Really. C kind uh, of an Ernie Kovacs thing going on there. You're, you're uh, that <laughs> record went gold. I, I, the tour I heard was magnificent, but I, I did not care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we had, you know, when, the thing about having four hours to fill and no budget was that you did reach out a little bit sometimes to fill some of the time. Well, I, 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 I thought it was funny as hell. But, um, it was a very volatile time, uh, politically and socially, oh, yeah. in which you were dealing. And uh, people talk about 1968 as being a, a watershed yeah. year, but 19, the period between 62 and 63, where you went from the Cuban Missile Crisis to the March on Washington and Martin Luther King to the Birmingham bombing with children being killed, and then to the assassination of President Kennedy, how did you incorporate what was going on in the world. Well, into... for instance, a year after President Kennedy was killed, I went down to Washington, and we had a sister station down there in Washington. I think it was, the, was it WTOP, I think. Um, I went out to the grave site of President Kennedy. It was a year after he was buried there. And as kids came through, and they were coming through at their parents, to look at the, I interviewed the kids about what they remembered of him and why they were there. And it, it was an extraordinarily touching piece. And then I also went to some schools and I said, have kids draw their memories of that event. What do they remember about it? And then we took some of those drawings and then we did the, the interviews at the, at the grave site. I tell you, narrating that was one of the most difficult things. I kept breaking down myself when I was trying to do the narration. So there were ways we did it. You know, that was a, a rather serious and, and unponderous way. But the other would be having uh, Senator Kennedy would be on every year to talk to us. Which is an amazing phenomenon. You almost set up a press conference type uh, situation with kids, with kids yeah. sitting there, and, and we have a clip of that that well, we're going to show. Well, and the way it came about was, is uh, take a moment to set it up. He had just been elected senator. He was still senator-elect mm -hmm. Kennedy. And in November of '64, the year he was '64, yeah, the year he was elected, um, I got a call from his people in New York saying the senator was going to go around to various. Um, poor areas in the New York area and, and give out toys and food and this thing he had been doing in Washington while he was there, he would like to do it in here and we would like you to go with him. Now, a year after his brother was killed, he was Attorney General, he's now Senator-elect and he's asking me to go with him, you would have thought I said, wow. But what I said was, okay, here's the deal. 
if he'll come and talk to the kids on my show, I'll do it. And they call back a year later, a week, an hour later, sorry, an hour later, I said, you got it. So that's what we did, and we did it every year for all those years. And he came on the show every year. And then we became acquaintances, and, and, and we had a very nice relationship that flowed from that. But the great thing about Senator Kennedy when he came on the show was that he proved to be really good at talking with kids. And if you watch him in the interview, which I presume you're going to show, mm -hmm. watch how he <coughs> never takes his eyes off the kids. He doesn't talk to me. Mm -hmm. He doesn't talk to the camera. He's looking at the kids and how he talks with them. So well, let's take a look at that clip now. Yes, sir. Do you think all the money that we've been spending on this nation's space program should be spent on this or should be spent on poverty bills and such? Well, I think and we can why? do the space, make the space effort. I think uh, it's worthwhile. It's the exploration of the atmosphere. And I think that um, while there is ever an unknown, man's going to search the unknown. So I think that that's worthwhile. I think we can take these other programs as well. Okay. Uh, are you going to do your best to cooperate with Mayor-elect Lindsay? Yes, I said that. Mm -hmm. I'd be glad to. I think everybody should. The city of New York faces difficult problems. Uh, Senator Kenny, how did you feel when you were hit with eggs in Latin America? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I didn't like it very much. <laughs> like, you know, yes, but I, and then, uh, <laughs> but it wasn't uh, too bad. I can understand it. And those are some of the problems that we have. And that was just a minority, a small minority. But, uh, uh, while we're on South America, let's talk about that. The impression I think a lot of the boys and girls here have is that you, wherever you went, you were met by howling, egg-throwing mobs. That wasn't quite the picture, was it? No, no, they were very, very friendly. Just terrifically friendly to people in Latin America. And uh, all the vast majority of students, although they have some feeling against the United States, are, not, are very friendly friendly and very polite and very uh, hospitable. There were, this was a small minority, 50 or 60 out of tens of thousands of students and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that I met. So, and you can have that here in New York in the campaign, people threw things. You know, so it's not just Latin America. Well, what about uh, South American children? Did you get a chance to? Yeah, I saw a lot of them. They have the same hopes that all you do. They get, that they do well in school. A lot of them can't go to school. And uh, a lot of villages that I visited, uh, seven out of ten children die before the age of one because they don't have enough to eat, hmm. don't have pure water, and there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands don't have any school to go to at all, and uh, maybe don't even have one or two meals a day, and, and they have uh, disease, so they have a very difficult time. So we're very uh, lucky in the United States. Well, it would be hard for me to imagine a uh, children's television show tackling issues like that and having a hard news guy like you turned into before our eyes uh, in that clip. Well, I've been a correspondent for The Voice of America for two and a half years. I'd covered the war in Korea. I was a war correspondent in Korea. I had some, some experience in doing that. Mostly though, it was a matter of being relaxed with him. It was a matter of not not being a, 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 a news person with him, but having a conversation with the kids for him. But mostly getting him to talk with the kids. It wasn't about me, it was about him and the kids. Now it's my understanding that you plan on doing a Wonderama. Well, uh, I was approached by three of my acolytes in New Jersey who own a theater somewhere around Passaic. And um, so on December 1st, they've convinced me to do a show which will be only, <laughs> It, for, for you guys and gals between 55 and 65 who are my kids, we're going to try to build up a program where you can go and be 10 years old again for 90 minutes and sort of recapture some of those things that we did on Wonderama. We'll tell you, know, you can ask jokes and we'll, we'll do things like that, maybe play a little Simon Says, and have some clips and have some fun and I want to talk with everybody. It's a 199 seat house, so I don't know how many of you will be able to get in there, but, but it's, it, it, it would be fun, I would think, to, to sort of go back and, because I've had a chance to talk to my fans from time to time, and I have done some, show, some appearances uh, flogging the book, especially where I've had a chance to meet people when, they, when I have a book signing, everybody who comes up has a, an anecdote, something that connected with their life that they had to share with me. I love that part of it. Only moments, minute, two minutes, and then they're gone. Well, I, the book is terrific. 
Uh, and I'm one of those kids, by the way, a oh. former one there. I'm and a graduate. You see, he turned out well. No, see, well, it, it, I'll that, take credit. It, it's, uh, all right, sure. One of his stories in this book uh, is so compelling that um, I, I, you, you're asked about it, and I guess, all the time now, but it's something about you that we didn't know, and that was your service during the Second World War. And in particular, the experience uh, during the Battle of the Bulge of being taken prisoner. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and what it meant to you and how it affected the rest of your career? Well, yeah. Uh, I went into the Army as a wimp. I was really a, I mean, trust me, I, you can read about it in the book, but, uh, but uh, I was an authentic wimp. And the Army experience transformed me. Uh, and when I, two and a half years later, I was not the person who went in. And probably the most annealing part of that was my experience being a prisoner of war and how to cope with that. Because what you have to do is you have to go through experiences that test you. And now we call that outward bound and you spend a lot of money doing that. Uh, I, I got this for free, see. Um, and both being tested under battle conditions, which is uh, finding out what you're capable of coping with. But then in the prison camp, it's a whole different set of situations that you have to deal with. And to be able to live through that and, and realize that not only were you able to outlast it physically, but to really mentally and, and attitudinally take control of that situation and come out okay on the other side, that was, that was the most important part of that experience. Plus, making the world safe for democracy. Well, <clears throat> thank you for your service, but yeah. it, more specifically, with the knowledge that the SS was at that point of the war killing POWs, uh, you refused to deny the fact that you were Jewish oh, when yeah. interrogated. Yeah. Oh, well, or at least uh, in... Uh, well, this was the only prison camp that happened. There's a wonderful co documentary by Charlie Guggenheim on this, by the way. But... Um, it, it happened to be the only prison camp where they tried to separate, they did separate Jewish POWs from non-Jewish POWs and sent a bunch of them, about 300 of them, out to work in slave labor camp out in the middle of, of Germany in salt mines. And, and about 80 of them never came back. I, so I was not prepared to be faced with the question, you know, I'm supposed to give name, rank, and serial number. Then they went on beyond that and uh, I figured if they knew my father's name, that he was in textiles, that wouldn't necessarily... So I was hungry, and I was standing in snow, and I wanted to get where it was warm. I told them. Then I heard the question, religion. I had not expected to hear that. <sighs> Maybe because I had already surrendered once, and they didn't really want to do it again. I, I just said Jewish. Fortunately, I had an American GI they had put down, a, a, put in as a clerk at that point, the Germans had. And he looked at me and he said, Protestant. And I thought, maybe he didn't hear me. So I repeated it. I said, Jewish. And he said, Protestant. And I left, and I didn't know whether he had, what he'd done. I didn't care. I just wanted to get in and get something to eat and get warm. Two, two weeks later, they came through, and they did remove everybody who had Jewish names, looked Jewish, or thought might be Jewish. And I stayed behind and escaped that particular part of it. But that was always a problem for me because it, feel to, it felt to me, although I did volunteer to say I was Jewish at first, and the second time when they took my co-religious away. But, but the, sad, the sad note, I have to say, in all honesty, is that night in the POW barracks, which was now presumably Juden-free, having removed the Jews, I heard anti-Semitic jokes being hurled into the darkness of, of the... The Nazis didn't have a lock on anti-Semitism. I, I wish we could continue this conversation for, for a very long time. <laughs> your, your experiences there helped inform your production of The Tomorrow Show with Tom Snyder. Uh, you went on to and, and continued to go on to do pioneering work in, in, uh, in television. Uh, we'd love to have you back here. 
and, and continue the conversation. I, but I, so. I love that train trip out from New York that stops every minute and a half at lovely little villages along the way and lovely stations that are so redolent of a past that I expected to see horse and buggy carriages on the, on the road alongside the right of way. No, it, it's, it's, I'm sorry I, I don't live here anymore. I live in California, so the chances of coming out. Well, one quick question about Snyder. Why weren't you the one doing the interviews instead of Tom? <laughs> you know, that, that touches on a very delicate thing. When Tom, when I came out, Tom knew I had done shows like this. And I think he thought I was there in case he failed. And I took him aside and I said, Tom, I want you to know, I am out here because I really want to go back into production. I've had 15 years of doing this other kind of thing. I always wanted to be a producer, and now I really want to seriously do it. So I just want to know, I'm here to produce, you're here to perform. Well, <clears throat> truly landmark television and the, and the topics that you covered uh, and, and the guests that, uh, that you had. So I, 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 I think that it was uh, the perfect segue from Wonderama to, uh, <clears throat> to push the envelope further in terms of television well, production. Here I am. I finally made it big. Exactly. I'm I, on carpe diem, for God's sakes. Uh, that, there's not much left to do, but I'm sure you'll find <laughs> it. <laughs> if you'd like more information about Sonny Fox or about any other carpe diem program, you can write to us at the email address on your screen, carpe diem at mail.montclair.edu. Or call us at 973-655-5158. Operators are standing by. For Carpe Diem, I'm Charlie Sanders. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time, and thank you, Sonny. Thank you, Charlie.